Thank you for listening to the official podcast of Canyon Creek Baptist Church, where our goal is to know Jesus and make Jesus known. To learn more about Canyon Creek, visit us online at creekfamily.org. Today's sermon comes from Pastor Josh Murray. Uh, We're in the second week today of a series called Jesus Never Said That, and we're taking a look at just a few cliche Christian sayings that sound biblical, uh, but they're actually very harmful. Uh, We're addressing some of these bumper sticker Christian sayings that we've all heard and probably even said ourselves. Uh, And last week we talked about the first phrase, which was God won't give you more than you can handle. Uh, If you missed that, I want to encourage you to go on our website and and listen to that. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about the phrase, everything happens for a reason, uh, which is maybe my favorite one of the four. And then we'll end with uh, the saying, God is my co-pilot. So that that should be fun too. But today, we're going to talk about this phrase. Are you ready? It's, God helps those who help themselves. Does this phrase sound familiar to anyone? Here's the really alarming thing about this particular saying. Barna Research Group did a survey and found that seven out of 10 Christians in America believe that this phrase comes directly from the Bible, okay? Spoiler alert, it doesn't, okay? This is not in scripture. This is not in the Bible. But over 70% of Christians in America believe that this is straight from the Bible, And what that maybe tells me is that 70% of Christians in America don't read the Bible (laughs) because it's not there. Uh, But because we believe that it is, because we believe that it's true, we say it with confidence to ourselves and to others. God helps those who help themselves. Let's be real though. There are plenty of verses in the Bible that we never quote, that we never say quite like these ones. So why this saying? Why are we so drawn to this even when it's not in the Bible. I think part of the reason is because we believe that we have to make it through on our own. You know, I'm, I have a, a two-year-old daughter at home. She's turning three this week. And right now, one of her favorite sayings is, no, let me do it. And uh, that is something that we carry into our adult lives. We believe that we have to make it, that we have to figure it out on our own. And we approach other people with this sort of understanding that if you would just do what I've done, then you would be okay too. And I think that sort of callous grows on our hearts and we forget just how much has been given to us. We forget just how much we've been blessed by God and by others. I think we sometimes say this phrase so that we don't have to feel responsible for helping other people. We say, well, God helps those who help themselves, so I don't have to worry about helping you. We're off the hook. Sometimes I think we even say it out of frustration with people who we think are lazy and taking advantage of the system, which does happen, by the way. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But the origin of this statement came long before we ever had cars to put bumper stickers on. This goes all the way back to the 5th century BC. In the 5th century BC, in Greek mythology, there was a story called Hercules and the Wagoner. You might have heard of this before, but there's a line in the story where the character prays to the Greek god Hercules for help, and Hercules shows up and says, get up, put your shoulder to the wheel, because the gods help those who help themselves. That's where this comes from. So why are we talking about this? Why did we include this one in this series? What's the significance? It's not from the Bible, we get that. I think part of what's so dangerous about this particular saying is that it reveals how most Christians view their relationship with God. Right, we think, okay, I've got to figure this out. I've got to pull this together. I've got to keep it together. I've got to put some sweat equity in on this. If I could just get my life together, then God will help me, but only after I've helped myself. 
I think many of us would even admit that we agree and believe the line from Hercules that I should just put my shoulder to the wheel, then God will come through for me. I think maybe the most important or the more important question to ask is why do so many Christians believe that this is in the Bible? And I'm not sure, but it does sound slightly similar to what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians. Let's take a look at this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul writes, in fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. Now remember, it's very important that we read the Bible in its context. Typically, we pull a verse like this out of context and we think, yeah, that sounds good, right? And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a favorite Bible verse. Again, don't hear what I'm not saying but it can be very easy for us to miss the meaning of scripture because we're not paying attention to the context that these phrases and these verses were written in. In the case of this verse that we're reading right now, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, the church had a common fund that everyone shared. Think of it like this. If every one of us in this room put all of our money together in one bank account and everybody had a debit card, that's how the church worked back then. There was one common fund and everyone had access to that fund as they needed. And unfortunately, there were some people who were slacking in their own work and they weren't contributing to the common fund the way they were supposed to. In other words, they were just showing up and solely relying on everyone else's efforts and still benefiting from the shared money. So Paul, as he often does, calls them out. That's what Paul's doing in this verse. That's the context of this verse. He's not saying everyone just needs to to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and figure it out on their own. He's not saying God helps those who help themselves. He's setting some healthy boundaries and saying, hey, it's a good thing for us to help each other out when we're in need. We absolutely should do that. But you cannot use this as an excuse to not work and not contribute to the shared fund and just benefit from it. So the question is, if the Bible doesn't actually say that God helps those who help themselves, then what does the Bible have to say about who God actually does help? And there are probably a dozen directions that we could go today. Uh, But there's one passage in particular that I think will help us out. It's Proverbs chapter 31. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. Remember, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Okay? And it's worth noting that these Proverbs aren't promises, they're wisdom. In other words, you can do everything the book of Proverbs tells you to do and still not experience the perceived guaranteed outcome of the book. Why? Because this is wisdom, not promises. But Proverbs chapter 31, the writer of Proverbs is remembering the advice of his mother. So when you read this chapter of Proverbs, I want you to think of this as like, well, my mama said, okay, because that's exactly what's going on here. And at the beginning of the chapter, it says things like good leaders don't chase after women. It says that. It says good leaders don't drink too much. It says that. It says good leaders don't do things to numb their feelings. And then when we get down to verse eight, this is what the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 31, verse eight. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Now, I want to point out the fact that there are plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about being still or slow to speak. But in these two verses, we're encouraged not just once, but twice to speak up. For what? On behalf of those who are in need. Even a very casual reading of two verses of scripture makes it very clear that God cares for those who are vulnerable, who are at risk, and who are in need. The Bible tells us that they need our voice that we need to speak up on their behalf. It might be because they don't have a voice or it might be that they're shouting as loud as they possibly can, but no one cares to listen to them. So God helps those who help themselves. Is it biblical? No. Could we even consider this a Christian saying? I would say no. 
In fact, I would argue that this is a very non-Christian saying because I believe that God calls his church to speak up for those who cannot help themselves, those without a voice, those who are in need, those who are poor, those who are oppressed. I believe that God is calling his church to speak up for these kinds of people. Why? Because they deeply matter to him. Okay, are you with me this morning? Notice what this verse says. It says, speak up, judge fairly, and defend the cause of the oppressed and the needy. I want us to focus on these two words, judge fairly. What does this mean in the context of this verse? I believe it means that we are to look beyond what we often see at face value. Right now, as we're talking about oppressed and needy, I know that you have an image in your mind of a person that you know who fits this category. Judging fairly means that we don't see them as the sum of their mistakes. Judging fairly means that we see them as a person who God created. Judging fairly means that we see them as a dearly beloved image bearer of God. There's a book that I read recently that I really loved called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I highly recommend this book. But in this book, he tells a number of stories that all share and make the exact same point. And basically what he's doing in this book is he's making the case that advantage in many ways is accumulated. Uh, He writes this, he says, those who are successful are most likely to be given the kinds of special opportunities that lead to further success. Uh, And one of the examples that he gives is the example of hockey players in Canada. And he essentially asks this question. He says, how do you think you become a successful or great hockey player in Canada? What do you think it would be? Skill, right? Athletic ability, talent, lots of hard work, a good coach, all of these things would make sense. But that's not often the case. It turns out that in any elite group of competitive Canadian hockey players, 40% of those players were born between January and March. 30% were born between April and June, 20% were born between July and September, and only 10% were born between October and December. Now, why does this matter? Why are 40%, almost half, of all great Canadian hockey players born between January and March? It's very silly, but it's fascinating. I'm going to get to the point, I promise, okay? The eligibility cutoff date is January 1st. So a kid that turns 10 on January 2nd could be playing against someone who doesn't turn 10 until November or December. And at that age, a gap between a 10, 11, or 12-month advantage is massive. So in other words, if you're a boy born between January and March in Canada and you want to be great at hockey, you have an advantage through absolutely zero effort of your own. And I understand that that's a silly example, but if something as simple as the month in which you were born can make a difference in whether or not you become a successful hockey player, how much more might other factors increase or decrease your access to what Malcolm Gladwell calls the special opportunities that lead to further success? Are you with me? And I know that that might seem extreme or intense, but some of these other outlier stats give us a slightly different perspective. Like the fact that 30% of our homeless population suffers from severe mental illness. Or the fact that 80% of those in prostitution were sexually assaulted when they were children. Or the fact that 60% of incarcerated young men in our country spent time in the foster care system. Judging fairly means that we recognize that there are other factors beyond our own hard work that influence outcomes, both positively and negatively. Judging fairly means that we finally, maybe for the first time, recognize that I didn't actually accomplish all of this on my own. The Bible is full of these reminders all throughout the pages of scripture. One of my favorites is the story of Gideon. Before God sent Gideon and his army into battle, God dwindled Gideon's army down from 32,000 men to just 300 men. All right, And I want to show you the reason why. Judges chapter 7, verse 2, the, the Lord says to Gideon, you have too many troops, he says. Why? Too many troops for me 
to hand over the Midianites to you. Or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, I saved myself. I think we're all tempted at some degree to think, yeah, I made this happen. It's my education. It's my experience. It's my knowledge. It's my talents, my skill set. And all of those things are a gift. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But you also have to remember that the very breath you just took is a gift from God. You weren't owed any of that. That's just his kindness. Still, our temptation is to think that it's all about me. I did this myself. I did this on my own. We're like the Pharisees in the temple that said, thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector, right? There's another passage that I want to read, Deuteronomy chapter eight. And I want to read it to you, but I want you to imagine that you're there, okay? The Israelites, they've been freed from slavery, but they're still weeks away from entering into the promised land. And this is the warning they're given. Watch this, Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 10. The Bible says, when you eat and are full, you will bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. He says, but be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands, his ordinances, and his statutes that I'm giving you today. When you eat and are full and you build beautiful houses to live in and your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold multiply and everything you have increases, he says, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions. Are you sure they weren't in Texas? A thirsty land where there was no water. Look at what he did. He brought water out of the rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your ancestors had not known. Why? In order to humble and test you so that in the end, he might cause you to prosper. At that point, you may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember, everybody say remember, remember. that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as it is today. I think the temptation as we go through this life is that we'll forget what we've been freed from. And I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me on a daily basis to forget just how much I've needed God's forgiveness. I don't know about you, but it's easy for me on a daily basis to forget just how much I need his grace to get through today. It's easy for me to show up and believe that it's about my skill set or my connections or my talent when really it's all about him. So God helps those who help themselves? I don't think so. It's not true. It's not biblical. Here's what the Bible teaches us instead. God helps those who can't help themselves. That's the truth. This is the central message of the gospel that God helps those who can't help themselves. He helps those who could never do enough good things on their own to earn his love. He helps those who could never clean their lives up quite enough for him. Why do I know this statement is true? Because God helped me when I could not help myself. And my guess is that a lot of you here this morning have a very similar story. Think about that for just a minute. If you're in this place today, it's because someone somewhere along the way pointed you to Jesus. Someone displayed the kindness of God to you. Someone spoke up and shared the gospel with you. Someone made sure you got yourself into church. And prior to you coming to Jesus, your relationship with God was broken and there was nothing you could do to repair it. But God provided a way for you to come back to him. God helps those who can't help themselves. Paul says it this way, Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We read this verse so often that for many of us, it has become background noise. Listen, you need to be reminded of this today, that Christ didn't die for you after you got your life together. 
He didn't die for you after you started memorizing the weekly Bible verse, okay? He didn't die for you after you started attending church at least three times a month for a year or two. He didn't die for you after you started serving or tithing or whatever it is. No, the Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, while we still could not help ourselves, Christ died for us. When we could do nothing to set ourselves free or to help ourselves or to bring ourselves back to him, Jesus went to a cross and he died to set us free. I heard this illustration recently and I wanted to share it with you this morning. Are there any basketball fans in the room today, anybody? I'm not a big basketball fan, but I'm a fan of this, all right? Anybody know, what is the world record for the most consecutive free throws? You might think 75, right? 100, 125. Here's my challenge to you this week. Go home, find a basketball. What do they call it, a goal? (laughs) Basketball goal. Stand at the free throw line and see how many you can make in a row. The world record is 5,221, okay? A guy by the name of Ted St. Martin scored 5,221 consecutive free throws in April of 1996, and he holds the world record. So next time you score eight or 10 in a row and you think you're doing pretty good, 5,221, all right? Now imagine that Jesus shows up while you're shooting your hoops this afternoon. And he's like, hey, you wanna get to heaven when you die? You need to make 10,000 of these in a row. How would you feel in that moment? If you're me, you're like, man, I don't even know that I could get 1,000th of that in a row, right? You know, I don't even think I could make five. There's no way I could do this on my own. What Jesus would say to all of us in that moment is that's exactly the point. That there is nothing you could do to earn or deserve God's love, favor, or affection, or heaven, but God chose to help those who could not help themselves. Aren't you thankful for that? I love what John tells us, 1 John chapter three. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We didn't earn that. We didn't deserve that. While we were still dead in our trespasses and sins, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He came after us. He pursued us. Maybe you're hearing this message in a brand new way today. Maybe you've been trying really hard to tough it out and get through it in your own strength. Let me just tell you, God helps those who can't help themselves. He helps those of us who could never even dream of getting close to 10,000 free throws, right? And because God helped us, because Jesus laid down his life for us, John goes on to say this in verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them and says, God only helps those who help themselves, how can the love of God be in that person? Man, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Listen, this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's essentially saying that it is inconceivable for a follower of Jesus to say that we love God and not be willing to help someone in need. It's not how it works. Here's how it works. I believe that God helps those who can't help themselves often through his people. That's what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And next time you think, man, I just wanna be the hands and feet of Jesus, remember what those hands looked like. They were pierced. Remember what those feet looked like. Stakes were driven through them to hold them to the cross. That's what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We need to see people with a fresh set of eyes. I don't know what they're facing. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what their life looks like. And God brings people like that into each of our lives because he wants us to help them. Listen, we are God's plan A and there is no plan B. 
Maybe you're at a place in your life today where you are that person. Maybe you're at a place where you'd wave your white flag and you say, Lord, would you help me? Because I can't help myself. Jesus came and he said to all of his followers, which includes us, he said, as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. Remember what John said, that God loved us so much that he laid down his life for us. And I believe that he calls us to do the very same thing. And I believe that he means it. So God helps those who can't help themselves. The truth is you can keep striving in your own strength. You can. I see a lot of people doing it. But as long as you continue to do that, I don't think you'll ever experience the fullness of all that God has in store for you. But for the Christians, for the followers of Jesus, the way that we honor the God who helped us when we could not help ourselves is by helping those who need help. So we need to live as sent people. We need to be agents of God's mercy and grace. We need to push back darkness when we see it, not for our glory, not for our recognition, not for our fame, not to make us feel good, but so that others may see our Father in heaven and praise him because of the work that we're doing. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you so much that you saw us in our brokenness, in our mistakes, in our sin, and you loved us still. We thank you, Father, when there was nothing we could do to earn your love, to earn your affection, to earn salvation, to earn grace, to earn mercy, to earn forgiveness. Father, that you sent Jesus while we were still sinners to die on our behalf. And we pray, God, that you would send people to us who need your help. God, we wanna help them. Even this week, Father, we invite you to send people to disrupt us on our path that we can share your love with. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, maybe you're at a place in your life today where you are striving in your own strength, where you're crumbling under the weight of trying to hold everything together. Let me just tell you, if you turn to Jesus, He's going to help you. He's going to show up in your life. He's going to move powerfully on your behalf because he loves you, because he cares about you. You can experience forgiveness and salvation in a relationship with Jesus Christ because God sent him to this world. He lived a perfect life. He died a brutal sinner's death on a cross and he was buried in a tomb, but he came out of it alive so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him. So if that's you today, you wanna to place your faith and your trust in Jesus. I just wanna encourage you to pray this simple prayer with me this morning. Church, let's make this our prayer together. Heavenly Father, I'm trusting Jesus to save me from my sin and to be the Lord of my life. I put you first and I ask that you would forgive me and transform me and save me and fill me with your spirit so that I can know you personally and share you faithfully. Thank you for new life. I give you all of mine in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You've been listening to the official podcast of Canyon Creek Baptist Church. If you made a decision to commit your life to Jesus or would like to get connected with Canyon Creek, visit us online at creekfamily.org forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. Thanks again for joining us.